Call the meeting of the Capital Planning Commission meeting or Capital Planning Commission to order. And I'd like to remind everyone that uh, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Uh, <laughs> commissioners and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom on a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on the website. If we could put that up on the screen, please, as to how people can participate. There we go. So you can dial in by phone. The numbers are there. And uh, once you're <clears throat> an attendee, if you raise your hand as a participant, just wait to be unmuted, and you can make your comments at that time. Okay, with that, uh, maybe with the roll call, please, Edna? Sure. Uh, Commissioner Christensen? Here. Commissioner Newman? Uh. Commissioner Westman? Here. Commissioner Wilk? Here. And Chair Ruth? Here. Thank you. And now we will have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, for which it stands, under God, under God, liberty and justice for all. That's one of the reasons we need to meet live. <laughs> okay, so do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda, Katie? This evening, we do have additions to the agenda. Um, for item 4B, the appeal, uh, there was a, an email that came in yesterday from a neighbor, as well as additional uh, photographs. There was a letter that was attached to the original staff report. Uh, the photographs were not put into the packet by accident. so. Those have been sent out in, er in errata to the Planning Commission. Um, Planner Sasanto will have those available that he can pull up when the neighbor speaks. Um, but two items came in for item 4B. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And I failed to mention our technician tonight is Noel Cobby again. And uh, thank you, Noel, for broadcasting us to the members of the public. Um, Now's the time for public comments for any items that aren't on tonight's agenda. Uh, so if there's anyone out there who wants to bring something before the Planning Commission tonight mm -hmm. that's not on the agenda, we'll give you a few seconds to respond. Chair Ruth, I am not seeing any public comment on our email this evening, and I'm looking at the Zoom participants, and there are no hands up currently. Okay, thank you, Katie. So that brings us to item C, commission comments. Are there any commissioners that uh, have any comments tonight? I, I do have one. Commissioner Newman? Uh, yes, I, I wanted to just briefly uh, bring up the issue of the taqueria that's located on the Esplanade. Uh, they came in uh, sometime earlier in the year for a sign permit after being busted, um, and we granted them a sign permit on the condition that they kept the walkway that's required by the Coastal Commission open, and they're having a lot of difficulty doing that. So I'm wondering if there has been any, any interaction between them and the staff in that regard, or uh, what the um, plan is. Um, at this point, we can send them a, a courtesy warning letter, and then if they don't comply, we can bring the conditional use permit back to the Planning Commission. <clears throat> if you yeah, know. I mean, I, I know it's been difficult for restaurants, but um, I mean, that, that's been the rule from the beginning there. It's been a condition imposed for many years by the Coastal Commission. What they do is they put three or four tables out there. And then the people, as soon as they sit down, they kind of just spread out into the walkway, and it's essentially closed off to the public. So they know it, but they um, 
it's just difficult, I guess, for them to comply with, just like the sign ordinance was difficult. They do know the rules. I have had a conversation with them once in the past, so I, I think it's time for we can send out a courtesy letter, something more formal. <clears throat> okay. Any other commission comments? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move on. Any staff comments? Um, no comments this evening. Um, I, I'll have a director's update at the end of the meeting. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Okay, that brings us to the approval of minutes. These are the minutes from the meeting of April 1st, 2021. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. This is Commissioner Wilk. Okay, is there a second? I'll second approval. Okay, Commissioner Christensen seconds. We have the roll call, please, Edna. Yes, uh, Commissioner Christensen. Aye. Commissioner Newman. Aye. Commissioner Westman. I'll abstain because I was not at the meeting. Commissioner Wolf. Uh, aye. And Chair Ruth. Aye. Okay, so the minutes are approved as submitted. That brings us to item four on the agenda tonight, which are public hearings. Our first public hearing is 2110 41st Avenue. This is for a monument sign, design permit, and a conditional use permit uh, for the master car wash, which uh, hopefully will soon be in operation again. So, with the staff report, please. Thank you, Chair Ruth. Uh, as you mentioned, the applicant tonight is requesting a design permit, conditional use permit amendments for uh, master car wash. Uh, for most of you, this is going to sound very familiar because it was here back in December and was approved. Uh, but for the benefit of the public and, uh, and our new Planning Commission member, I'm going to go through uh, the presentation again related to what's there now, uh, what was approved in December, and the changes that they're requesting now. Uh, I did want to add that building official Robin Woodman is going to be joining us, but she's teaching a class tonight. so. She will be on around 7.20, um, so when she joins, we'll go ahead and get her um, in as a participant, and she'll be able to answer questions. And then uh, the applicant and owner are both going to be on the call, and they have brought their civil engineer, Todd Creamer, and their landscape architect, Megan Bishop, as well. So we have a, a plethora of people who can answer questions tonight at the end if you have questions about this project. Hey, Next thank slide. you, man. You're welcome. Next slide, please. So 2110 41st Avenue is located on the east side of 41st Avenue between Mattress Firm and Kentucky Fried Chicken. The 25,000 square foot lot is in Capitola's main commercial corridor along 41st Avenue. Uh, the current site design approved under 2006-050 uh, includes a one-story main building attached to a car wash tunnel and a large trellis with vacuum drops, as shown here. Uh, it was just... Uh, badly damaged in a fire last year, which is the reason why it hasn't been closed for um, most of the pandemic. Next slide, please. This is the existing site plan. So under the current business model, the business offers both exterior only and full service vehicle cleaning services. Uh, the trellis with vacuum drops is shown here in red. The uh, vacuum equipment shed is in green. The detail room is in yellow and the car wash tunnels in blue and the recycling tanks are in orange at the top of your screen. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, this came previously uh, to the Planning Commission in December. Uh, the site plan approved under permit 200460 uh, included a reduction in the size of the main building, uh, the addition of two new freestanding canopies with solar panels and 12 vacuum drops, two new self-service kiosks, as shown here in yellow, and a new drive-through lane that circled the south, east, and north perimeter of the lot and led to the car wash tunnel. I have also added the 10-foot uh, the um, rear landscape buffer line in red here so that you can see, this is gonna come into play on the next slide, uh, but so you can see where the original drive lane is located and how it got, it went within that 10-foot landscape area. Next slide, please. So this is the proposed site plan tonight. Uh, the changes to the site plan are shown here in red, and those include the removal of five feet four inches from the rear of the car wash tunnel, 
the relocation of one employee parking space from the parking area on the south side of the building to the area adjacent to the self-service kiosks, that's the little red star. Uh, the removal of the freestanding canopies with solar panels, I uh, followed up with them. I, I, some of you may remember in the last approval, they were given the option to either do the freestanding canopies with solar panels or um, just freestanding vacuum stations with no canopies. And uh, just due to the delays in the project, they're opting to just drop the canopies from this uh, from this application. So that's why you're not seeing those on the plans tonight. <laughs> uh, and then the major thing here was the relocation of the drive lane 10 feet from the rear property line. So that's the uh, the five red arrows that show how it was moved from within the 10 foot landscape strip to the 10 foot mark. And I'll go into later why why that was done. Next slide, please. Uh, the zoning code does not have a specific parking requirement for car wash use but the original conditional use permit required eight on-site parking spaces for employees. Currently, the parking is out of compliance with only three on-site parking spaces. However, the current proposal includes the eight on-site employee parking spaces that were required under the last conditional use permit and under conditional use permit 200460, shown here in blue. Uh, since the man new management plan requires less employees, additional parking is not required as far as the last permit or this permit. Next slide, please. The new zoning code contains uh, residential transition standards to protect residential parcels that are adjacent to commercial parcels from potential negative impacts of the commercial land uses. In the previous approval, uh, the applicant provided a 10-foot 10-foot strip of landscape planting area with a tree screen along the rear lot line that is adjacent to the residential properties, except in the area where the existing car wash line is located. Now that the drive lane is being relocated, the entire 10-foot strip along the rear property line will be landscaped and include a tree screen. The design for you tonight complies with the residential transition standards. Next slide, please. Uh, a conditional use permit is required for land uses that are generally appropriate within a zoning district, but potentially undesirable on a particular parcel. A uh, conditional use permit is, is a discretionary action that enables the city to ensure that a proposed use is consistent with the general plan and will not create negative impacts to adjacent properties or the general public. The Planning Commission may attach conditions of approval to a conditional use permit to achieve consistency with the general plan, local coastal program, and our zoning code. Uh, in addition, when evaluating a conditional use permit, the Planning Commission must consider several characteristics of the proposed use, including those listed here. Um, those considerations are all analyzed in the staff report, but tonight I'm going to focus on D, which involves the physical suitability of the subject site for the proposed use. Next slide, please. So currently there's an 11 foot four inch high retaining wall that long, runs along the rear property line because the adjacent residential properties on Derby Avenue are at a much lower grade than the subject parcel. Uh, the last conditional use permit included condition of approval number 21, which required the owner to provide an engineering analysis for the retaining wall along the rear property line to ensure that the wall can continue to support the surcharge of vehicles adjacent to the rear lot line. In response to this condition, the applicant submitted a letter explaining their efforts to satisfy this condition of approval including engineering analysis and modifications to the previously approved project. Uh, firstly, to reduce the live load and ensure that the existing retaining wall can continue to support the surcharge of vehicles in the car wash lane, the amendment includes the relocation of the car wash drive lane 10 feet away from the rear property line. Uh, to reduce the hydrostatic load on the existing retaining wall, the proposed project includes uh, the removal of the existing sump pump for stormwater and installation of a new inlet that drains directly to an existing 54-inch stormwater culvert also, the existing shed at the rear of the property was removed under the previous permit, and that is still removed in this permit, which will reduce the dead load on the existing retaining wall as well. Uh, Todd Creamer, the principal engineer for C2G Civil Consultants Group, uh, who's on the call tonight, provided a retaining wall analysis, stating that these improvements will improve the lifespan of the existing wall, and no additional analysis is needed since the project is improving the conditions through project design. Uh, building official Robin Woodman reviewed the modifications to the site plan and analysis provided by C2G Engineering. Ms. Woodman accepted the report and the proposed modifications. However, the modifications to the previously approved project also require planning commission approval, which is why we're here tonight. Next slide, please. Uh, the applicant is also uh, proposing a new monument sign along 41st Avenue. The proposed monument sign is seven feet, six inches tall with a sign area of 33 square feet and a two-foot-tall ledge stone veneer base. The proposed sign compliance with all design standards. Next slide, please. So 
with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission review and approve Project Application 21-0149 based on the conditions of, and findings for approval. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Are there any questions for staff? Not at this time. Okay, hearing none, then we'll open it up to the public. Uh, I'm not sure if the applicant's present or if there's anyone wishing to speak, but now is the time if you have any questions, concerns, comments regarding the car wash on 41st Avenue. Um, we have so the, the applicant tonight is Bill Kemp and the uh, owner is David Carson. So um, I believe Bill is gonna be the main point of contact here. So um, if you'd like to ask the applicant questions, that's who should be uh, un unmuted at this point. I've, I've just uh, okay. let Bill Kempf into the meeting, and he can speak now. Okay. Are there any questions for Mr. Kathleen? Hi, guys. This is uh, Bill Kempf. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so I'm the architect for the project, and deja vu. We're, we're back here again. Um, so thanks for, for getting us in here quickly, Matt. You, you were really helpful in making this happen quickly. As you know, David is very interested in getting his business back up and running again. Um, the, the project is going forward basically as originally um, originally approved with the exception of making adjustments to the back of the project as was just explained. Um, this was uh, in response to, to that one, uh, one comment regarding the, the retaining wall. And uh, we spent a lot of time trying to track down the original designers. Uh, we were unsuccessful in that. Um, we talked to a lot of engineers and, and um, in the end, we came up with this, uh, this approach of moving the drive aisle away from the wall to, uh, it, it's generally understood in structural engineering that um, a one-to-one -one slope is, a, um, is an area of influence for, for forces. And so that's with roughly a 10 foot tall retaining wall, we've moved the drive aisle 10 feet away from the, uh, from the retaining wall. And we also discovered um, through some videos of the, of the property that um, we, uh, we found that the, um, the existing drainage uh, did not, uh, it seemed like it wasn't originally um, constructed as it was designed. And so very early on when this wall was built, there was some hydrostatic pressure on it that uh, caused some, some issues and, and there was some analysis done within a year or two of its construction. Um, it's, it's been in place for, for almost 30 years now and um, we're, we're going by the approach that by moving, moving the loading away from it, that, that it, will, it will be, uh, a much better condition than what was there previously. If you have any questions, we have plenty of people here to answer them. Uh, get technical if you want. Um, what I've got. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. Are there any questions from the commission? I have a question. This is Commissioner Wilk. Um, I was having trouble understanding the, the drainage issue as I re reviewed this package. Um, you removed a sump pump and diverted drainage away from the wall, is that correct? Is that part of the plan? I, I think it would be helpful if we could let Todd uh, Creamer, the engineer on the project, into, into the discussion. Okay, um, Todd, if you unmute yourself, there you go. So a, a, a small correction, so it's not a sump pump. What really, it, it, the inlet was considered a what we call a sump, but it it has an open bottom. So when water goes into it and the stormwater is collected into the inlet, its first uh, intention is to infiltrate the water into the ground. And if the, if the storm event's so large that the ground cannot keep up with the, storm, the water entering by infiltrating, it builds up within the sump and it overtops into a pipe that then connects to the 54 inch culvert at the rear of the property. We're going to eliminate the infiltration aspect of this inlet. So it will have a concrete bottom that does not allow water to infiltrate into the ground, which happened to happen within 
four feet of the retaining wall. Okay. So the uh, the seepage at the retaining wall that, uh, which I believe the neighbors complained about that it would it would there be seepage through the retaining. So, so this would tend to alleviate that because now you wouldn't have a lot of hydrostatic pressure and a lot of water settling in that area, uh, but it would it would be quickly drained away. Is that Correct. the idea? Correct. Yeah. There's a direct connection to the 54 inch culvert from the the car wash property. It's now that when it rains, that stormwater goes through that pipe to the culvert and doesn't infiltrate anymore behind the wall. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, Mr. At, the, at the time that catch basin was constructed, was that designed to capture all the runoff or just a portion of it? Looking at the grading plan, I would say two thirds of the property was to be directed to that inlet and the other third was to be directed towards 41st Avenue. Okay, all right. So that's sufficient for the site. Is it runoff of the lot then? Y yes, it is. Okay, any other questions for uh, the applicants? I had a, just a quick comment. And I think- Mr. Newman? Mr. Westman did also. We This hand system isn't working so well, but. So, uh, not to give away my uh, leanings on this, but I'd just like to say that I think that the uh, applicant and his team took a good project and made it even better. That's it. Um, I also want to announce that uh, we do have Robin Woodman on the line if the Planning Commission has any questions for Robin, the building official. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Uh, any other comments? Uh, I had um, one comment. Um, I, re I was not here in December, but looking at the design now, I really appreciate the fact that they've in added that 10-foot landscape buffer at the rear because this project does back up to those single-family residential homes. Um, the one concern I have is that in their landscaping plan, the trees that they're proposing to use to provide a screen are palm trees. And we all know as palm trees grow up, you sort of end up with a, you know, 12 to 18 inch stick going up in the ground. So I wanted to ask the applicant if it would be possible to replace um, perhaps four of the trees that are in the back landscaping with some other um, tree, doesn't have to be a huge tree, but something that would have a canopy to it, so we actually would be providing a screen to the residential neighborhood that's behind. So the, the, um, the owner of the property, he is he is changing it from master car wash to splash car wash, as maybe you saw on the, uh, the sign, and he's going with more of a tropical feel, so that's, that's why the palm trees were, were proposed. I do, have, um, I do have the landscape architect um, here, and she has said that these aren't your standard palm trees. These are, these are more of a, a shorter palm tree that, that fans out. Um, I'd prefer to have her answer those questions. I know nothing about trees. Okay. Well, I, I will tell you, I did look up the palm trees because um, we had the landscape plan with the scientific names of the trees. And um, uh, th there are still palm trees. And uh, over the years, they are going to grow. And it would seem to me that there are a number of other kinds of trees that have some sort of canopy that over the years will provide a visual screen. I mean, the whole reason for having this 10-foot strip is to provide that screen for the residential neighborhood. OK, well, one, one thing we are concerned about is putting a lot of landscaping back there that's going to create more of a live load. I, I'm not asking for any more landscaping. I'm just asking that, um, you know, the four palm trees be replaced with some other, um, and I think there are a lot of other tropical trees besides palm trees, be replaced with a different kind of tree. We're, we're happy to make, make changes. Susan, I have. Uh, two dwarfed queen palms in my front yard, 
and they max out at about 12 feet. Right. They they have That's some cold. of those in the plan, but they also have uh, a palm tree that does get taller, four of them, which is what are the trees that they're referring to. And I actually have to get a magnifying glass to read it off the sheet about what, it, what that tree is called. But I did look them up, and, and they do grow to be a taller palm tree. So it's those four trees I'm interested in. The other small palms can absolutely stay. Okay. We'll bring that up under the Planning Commission discussion portion when we get to that. Uh, I'd just like to add that uh, I've probably had more interest in the opening of this car wash and when it's going to happen than I've heard recently about the mall expansion. I can tell you this, there's a lot of community interest about getting this car wash open again. Um, so any other comments, questions we, for uh, staff or the applicant? Is someone clicking a pen? We do have... Uh, another we've got public comment waiting as well okay so any other questions so we'll uh, we, do, we have Robin Woodman on the line who's gonna have to go back to teaching the class so any questions for our building official no okay would you like nope. me to open the public no. comment yeah let's hear from the public at this time okay so we have Susan on the line, and I have it once Susan, once you unmute yourself, you are you can talk. Hello? 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 Yes, Susan, we can hear you. There's a big echo. Okay. Uh, my name is Susan Walton. <laughs> Sorry, it's echoing in the phone. And we live directly behind the car wash. We are all so very interested when it was will open, but mostly because we want it to be done right and not fast. Um, we have a number of questions. Number one, the fence that's being put up, we just wanted some more specific um, specifications, how thick it's going to be. Right now, the fence that's there, we can see lots of people through it, and they're looking right back at us, which is really unpleasant. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello? Hello? We, we can yeah. hear you. Susan. We're waiting for the rest of your questions. Okay. Um, the next thing we, on page 66 of the report, it said there was a soils report re required, and I wanted to know if that was done. Um, I also wanted to know the height of the trees, which I didn't find in the report, because that blocks our sunlight. Um, I wanted to know lights at night during the winter, what time the lights can be on till, because security lights have also been an issue at the car wash in the past. Not necessarily since the new owners, but it has been an issue. Um, we also wanted to know about the trash load. So you broke up? Are you still there? Susan, are you still there? It appears we've lost her on the public comment. Not 10 cars waiting back there. And when we counted today, you could have up to 10 cars waiting. Susan, we, so we, just one, Susan, if you could stop for one second. We lost about a minute and a half of your last comments. Uh, the last part we heard was your question about the trash, and then you broke up and disappeared. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so my question was, I think the trash was the last one before I mentioned the um, the amount of cars that will be waiting to go through the tunnel, which pre in the previous design before the fire, there were, there were not many cars that just sat at the back waiting to go into the tunnel. I think there were about three. And then the new design, it looks like there could be up to about 10 cars just sitting there waiting at any one time, which is obviously a ton of weight. And I'm wondering if that number of cars in that space, and I know it's 10 feet away from the wall, has been accounted for in the engineer's assessment. Oh, and then the final thing is that what do we do if this is all approved and then they're out of compliance because in the, there shouldn't have been the shed built at the back. That was out of compliance. 
but the pre the previous owner, not the current owner, the previous owner was incredibly volatile when we would talk to him about anything. But that was out of compliance and a number of other issues. They would run it later at night when they weren't supposed to and so on. So our concerns are our quality of life once it's up and running and what do we do if it's not, if there's, they're out of compliance. Okay, let's see if we can get those answered for you, Susan. Uh, Thank you. Whoever would like to take the first one, wall configuration and dimension. So the, the previous uh, conditional use permit and this conditional use permit both have just a condition that a six-foot uh, wood fence is built uh, without details on that fence. So I think the um, applicant would probably be the best person suited to answer what they're thinking in terms of the, uh, the design of that wood fence. Okay. Is the applicant still present? I am. So, so this is Bill uh, O'Kemp, the architect. Um, we, we would be happy to, to build a, a solid wood fence with, with no gaps in it of six feet. Um, there had been a discussion before of a, a um, concrete, a further concrete wall on, up there, but we, we prefer not to do that uh, because of the weight on the, on the existing retaining wall. So we, we can definitely have a, a provision in there, or even a condition that, that said that the wall would be a six foot wood fence that is solid in nature. Okay. Um, next question was the soils report. So the soils report wasn't required. The soils report was um, a condition of the engineer's report. And um, we, we felt it wasn't necessary after doing our analysis. Okay. So there hasn't been a soils report done. Okay, the third question she had was about uh, the tree height and probably similar to the issue Susan has raised. We're happy to make any changes that people see fit. Okay, well, okay, we can discuss that when it comes time. I believe that was actually uh, the inverse. Nice. Sorry. I, I think the tree thing is actually the inverse of Susan's because they are concerned about the loss of sunlight Susan was, was asking, actually asking for more canopy oh, to do more. So that, that's kind of at odds there, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, the lights at night? I'm not, I'm not sure if there's been a operating um, time proposed, um, but I, I know that David originally had prepared a, a business plan. Uh, I, I don't know if you have any I, I, I don't want to speak for him <laughs> um, as far as setting setting a time for for when they would close, um, but, but I would I would assume that uh, that would be something that could be conditioned. Okay, uh, there was a question about trash pickup. So the the um, trash enclosure is at the rear of the property. Um, it will have rolling dumpsters which. Uh, I, I doubt the, uh, the trash would actually be able to get uh, a trash, um, a garbage truck would be able to get back there to pick them up. So they would probably have to be wheeled to kind of the center of the property. So that'll be something that will be done by the employees. Okay. And that time would be similar to what it has been in the past, I presume. Okay. Number of cars waiting uh, and what that effect might have on the wall. Again, the idea is to be 10 feet away from the wall so the zone of influence of the cars is at a one-to-one -one slope and, and going to the bottom of the wall and not, not pressing on the top. And how many cars will be waiting maximum? Um, right against the wall, I, it's hard, hard to say. Um, but they once they come through the... Uh, through the pay machines, they will be probably in a in a singular file line. So across yeah, what, the back. Of, yeah, the capacity looks like it might be what six or seven cars from that pay station. Yeah, I would I would assume that. Okay, all right. And then her last question was compliance issues, and that's if they are out of compliance, Susan, uh, that would certainly be an issue the city would look at, and we can look at their conditional use permit and lean on them, uh, you know, worst comes to 
worse, the use permit could be revoked. So there's, there's lots of avenues that, uh, that the city can use to make sure they are in compliance. Okay. Do we have another public comment? Can I just add something, uh, Commissioner Ruth? To, yeah, to go ahead, question. Mr. Newman. I just want to point out that uh, condition 18 of the proposed conditions requires a six foot tall solid wood fence. Okay. And I, I'm seeing no more okay. participants with their hand up and no public comment in our email. Okay. With that then we'll... I did just see an, an email come in for the... Oh. I can go ahead and read it if you'd like. Yeah, would you, Sean, please? Yeah, it's from Ia Walton, and they stated that my concern of tree height is to maintain a screen and not get too high as to block sunlight. And on the okay. landscape plan, those are shown as uh, 10 feet for the pygmy date palm and 12 feet for the uh, jelly palm. So this, we're talking 10 to 12 foot height because that's that at maturity stuff. So. Okay, okay. That, thank I, you, Matt. Okay, with that, then we will. Yes? Correct. No more. There's no hands up and no more emails. Okay, then we'll close the public portion of this uh, item and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Uh, who would like to lead off here? Well, I think I could lead off and I could sort of clear up the tree issue. Um, it's as far as I'm concerned, if the applicant meets with the neighbors behind them and, you know, they agree on the trees, um, uh, that will work for me because they're the ones who are really going to be impacted by what's going to be planted there. So um, perhaps if they could just check in and work with the neighbors and come up with a solution, that, that would be fine. Hey. And as far okay. as the project is concerned, I agree with Chairman Ruth. I think people in town really want the car wash to be open, and I think they've done a nice job on their design, and I look forward to seeing it operating. Hopefully soon. Any other comments, questions from the commission? I so have a com comment. Christensen? Yep. <laughs> this is Commissioner Christensen. Um, I, I just remember when we approved this and we were making comments about the landscape, the, the rear 10 foot um, landscape barrier was to shelter the neighbors from sound, visibility, all that, you know, that's, that was their safe, you know, kind of their privacy buffer. And um, I, 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 to kind of spin off of Susan's, um, Commissioner Westman's comments, I don't have a problem with the palms necessarily. I just think that the intention of having that 10 foot buffer was to provide sound barrier and palms don't provide sound barrier. Like they don't provide sound delineation. So, I mean, like a spruce or some type of cypress would be appropriate there. They have flowering, um, I think it's a maple, um, a flowering bush and I just, I feel like I, I do appreciate the 10 foot buffer and it's a very nicely done landscape plan. I just would really love to see if they could really, in, you know, put some intention in those plants. So that's all, that's all I want to just say. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, any other comments? Yes, this is Commissioner Will. I'm, I'm trying to use the hand uh, thing, um, but I, but I that's agree not, that doesn't, doesn't always work. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I just really had a question of the, 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 the neighbor had a concern about the hours of operation and, and we must have something in the code already that limits the hours of, of operation. I guess that's a question of staff. They're not allowed to operate this 24 hours a day or are they? Uh -oh. I don't believe the code has any hours restrictions. I know with, with certain other conditional use permits, the planning commission has shied away from getting into dictating hours. So, um, I believe the commission could add a condition if they would like, but. So you're, you're saying that they could be open 24 hours if, uh, and, and that we have no restriction on that currently. 
I believe the only noise restrictions have to do with things like leaf blowers. I don't recall seeing anything specific to a car wash use yeah, we have, and found. Yeah, construction hours and leaf blower ordinance, but um, mm -hmm. the, the Planning Commission could add a, a an amount of time after closing for the lights to be turned off. You know, you'll want them on for a certain amount of time for cleanup. Did I ask the applicant what their planned hours of operation are? Yes. Um, I believe they had that in their previous one in December, but this they did not submit a resubmit a business plan with this because uh, it was not changing. So I, I could get that for you, but I do not have it right this well, second. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll look it up. Okay. Well, he's looking it up. Any other questions or comments? I think past practice there, I think it used to be closing at 6 o'clock, if I'm memory serves me correct, but I'm not 100% certain. I wouldn't support that kind of a condition. That seems too restrictive to me. I'm not proposing that, that restriction either at this point, but perhaps a 2 a.m. closure might be a little bit too late. Well, there is a general um, provision in our ordinance. There's some uh, noise uh, a noise uh, provision that could be uh, implemented if they were open at 2 a.m. and causing uh, disturbance. Yeah, but that, that's that's kind of was my my concern. Did we have an avenue if if yeah. neighbors complained and they were open all night? Do we have a, an avenue to? Um, to, per, to pursue the complaints. Same provision as uh, for barking dogs. Mm -hmm. I believe it's a nuisance provision. Uh, and I did look back, by the way, they were not in the hours proposed in the previous management plan. So, um, so we're not sure on the hours. I believe the applicant may be able to answer what they were prior to, prior to the fire. The applicant still present? Uh, the architect is, um, David, I'm, I'm I believe is, is on the road and, and listening in. I don't know that he has the capability of, of speaking, um, but it, it is it is going to require a couple people to be on site to, to run the operation, and uh, I, I would be surprised if it if it ran past eight o'clock at night. But I that's just me. I <laughs> I hesitate to say anything. Well. I I would be in favor of having some hours in there that they couldn't operate beyond, you know, perhaps maybe nine o'clock at night and the lights go out at 10, you know, something that I would feel would be reasonable for a car wash operation. And then it would be up to them to, you know, operate within those hours and perhaps have something saying that, you know, they can't start operating till like 8 o'clock in the morning. So then you're including what are considered sort of normal business hours. Uh, commissioners, this is Planner Sasanto. I do have an email uh, from the business owner stating that the hours of operation will be 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. That okay. and we yeah. just That's what it's been in the past. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Someone like to attempt a motion? I will uh, attempt a motion. I will move approval uh, with the conditions imposed uh, in the staff report with the addition that the applicant is uh, directed to work with the neighbors in selection of trees in the rear so that they can satisfy their various concerns of protecting sunlight and also protecting uh, their privacy. And my motion does not include any uh, limitation on hours of operation because I don't think it's a problem and I don't think we should uh, impose a condition where it's not broken. Question? Um, well, Yes, yeah, so the the, uh, the the notion of adding the condition of working with the neighbors is 
Did we do that before? Because it seems so vague. I can't imagine how you'd enforce that. We we have done this before. Uh, there was a mixed use building recently built on Bromer by the close to the corner of Forty First, and um, we worked with the neighbor and the property owner to identify a tree. You may you may want to in your condition to say ha have staff working with the property owner and the neighbor to find a mutual resolution. Um, so therefore staff could make the ultimate decision if, if they came to an impasse. So. I'll accept that uh, amendment to my motion. Okay, is there a second to the motion? I'll second it. Okay, any Do discussion have, on it? Yes, I'd like to discuss it further. Um, so my, my concern, I guess, would be would be staff judgment in this being the arbiter of the, of the discussion. I was uh, I noticed the applicant was very interested in having palm trees back there because that was part of their design and they wanted the tropical feel. And I and I think they that desire should be um, uh, catered to. Um, so I would hate to have a. Uh, um, a discussion going where that where they have to compromise the design and feel of their business um, in, in that particular regard I'd, I'd like to respond to um, to a sure will I, I don't feel that they should have to to replace the palm trees I feel that they should accentuate that planting plan with a substrate against the fence of some type of cypress or something specifically designed for sound barrier. It's just they could accentuate their existing planting plan, which is very nice with, with you know, the date palm and the jelly palm, along with, you know, a holly or something more substantial than the flowering maple bush. Because those things don't, I mean, they just, they're not, they're just not curated usually for sound buffer. Thank you, Courtney. Okay, I think we have a direction for staff on this. Is there a second, or we've had a second to the motion. May we have the roll call, please, Edna? Sure, Commissioner Christensen? I support the motion, I. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. The motion carries unanimously, and uh, hopefully the car wish will be cleaning cars soon. Okay, that brings us to the second public hearing tonight. This is uh, a public hearing regarding a tree removal at 527 Capitola Avenue. Uh, we have a staff report, please. Thank you, uh, Chair Ruth, and good evening. The item before you is an appeal of an administrative approval of a tree removal permit to remove one pine tree on a residential property located at 527 Capitola Avenue. Uh, there have been a number of, of uh, tree removal applications and appeals in the recent past, but I'm still gonna go ahead and walk through the process here. Um, I'll start with what general findings need to be made by staff followed by um, the general process and as, as well as the basis of the appeal itself. Next, the appellant will be given the opportunity to speak and answer any planning commission questions. And after that, the chair will open up the public portion of the hearing and that will be followed by the planning commission discussion and decision. So most tree removal permits are reviewed and approved at the staff level as indicated on this uh, flow chart on the left-hand side. They begin with a preliminary review by public works staff who can uh, tentatively approve that, that application um, of a non-heritage tree only if those findings for removal are contained within uh, the code section 1212.180 for non-heritage trees and if those findings can be made. If the findings cannot be made, the application is transferred to planning staff for further review. The city may, in that process, require the applicant to pay for an arborist under the contract of the city to provide an arborist report for the tree. 
The community development director will then make a determination based on the findings. Following, in this situation, following the site inspection, public work staff was able to make the required findings for removal, and therefore an arborist report was not required. Uh, following a posting and notice to the public that there was a pending tree removal application on the site, uh, the city received an appeal on March 24, 2021. The tree proposed for removal, as, as stated before, is a pine tree located in the front yard of 527 Capitol Avenue, approximately five feet from the public right of way. The tree is two and a half feet in diameter and estimated to be over 60 feet tall with a significant canopy spread over the subject property as well as the adjacent property of 525 Capitol Avenue. The tree is not a heritage tree and is not located in an environmentally sensitive habitat area. For either the Community Development Director or Planning Commission to approve the removal of a non-heritage tree, the removal must comply with findings within the aforementioned code section, and, uh, the subsections C1 through 4. Within C1, as shown on this slide, at least one criteria for removal must be made, which include the health or condition of the tree, safety considerations, and property damage. When Public Works performed the site visit, they found evidence supporting all three criteria for the removal. Because the health and condition, safety, and property damage uh, were visible, staff did not require an arbor support in this case. Each of the criteria for removal will be addressed uh, individually in the, these following slides. First, uh, the first criterion considers the health or condition of the tree with respect to disease, infestation, or danger of falling. In these images, there's evidence of that the tree is in poor health, where sap is visible on the, the bark. This is typical of insect infestate, infestation or fungal disease. Next slide. The, the tree also has a codominant has codominant leaders, three of them, where the main trunk splits into these codominant leads. The, this results in competing limbs and often weakens the overall structure of the tree. As codominant stems grow, they continue to grow against themselves and grow weaker over time, increasing the risk of branch failure or leader failure. The next consideration is safety. As I explained, there are uh, safety concerns with respect to the failure of one or more codominant leaders. Uh, there's a risk that the tree will fail due to poor structure, which could result in injury to those in the vicinity or those within the structures themselves. The third consideration is for, remo uh, for removal is for situations where a tree has caused or has the potential to cause unreasonable property damage and or interference with existing utility services. This slide looks at 527 Capitol Avenue. The roots are causing damage to the existing driveway as evidenced with, or by uplift and the cracking in the middle of the driveway. In this slide, uh, we're looking uh, from 525 Capitol Avenue. As you can see, the roots are causing damage to the walkway on the neighboring property. On this slide, that damage extends through the staircase walkway and into the structure as the stucco in the wall has begun to crack. With respect to interference with existing utility services, there is potential for issues should more, one or more co-dominant leader fail. The, some of the lines, uh, though we did not identify if they were the power lines themselves, go through the tree uh, in between the leaders. Finding number two is that all possible and feasible alternatives to tree removal have been evaluated, including, but not limited to, undergrounding of utilities, selective root cutting, trimming, and relocation. Due to the extensive ongoing damage caused by the roots, there are no feasible mitigation measures that can be implemented to address all considerations here. Staff does not believe that root cutting could be implemented to the extensive root surface growth, growth pattern without causing serious harm or death to the tree and without any kind of root uh, mitigation 
the uh, the damage that has been occurring to the adjacent structures and, and flat work would uh, continue. So those are the, the basic findings for uh, removal that staff would have to make or the planning commission would have to make. In the following slides, uh, we'll summarize the submitted basis of the appeal. Appellant states that the tree is in good health and does not have a history of causing safety issues. These are some of the, an excerpt from the uh, submitted appeal letter. The appellant, uh, appellant uh, suggests that risks posed by the co-dominant leaders could be further mitigated. I give the example of strapping. The appellant uh, further states that there are several benefits to the subject tree and trees in general um, uh, and what they provide to the community as summarized above. Finally, they, um, uh, we've summarized a list of recommendations made in regards to the municipal code and city policies regarding the processing of tree applications. that. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission review and uphold uh, the original administrative approval of the application based on the conditions of, and findings for approval. Okay, thank you, Sean. Are there any questions for Sean before we open the public hearing and hear from the appellant? So quick, two quick questions. Commissioner Newman? One, um, I think on page one, it says, uh, applicants, but it should say appellant at the top, or? Are, are you referring to the staff report, or? Yeah, the staff report, page one of the staff report, where it says applicant, shouldn't it say appellant? Uh, per, do you think you could go ahead and read me that line? I, I don't actually have yeah, it in front of me. Okay, well, it, we can take a look at that later. My other question is, do we know what kind of tree this is? It, it's, it's clearly a variety of pine. Our the staff uh, estimation is that it's a Monterey pine. That's what I was thinking. It's a Monterey pine. Okay, that's all. Okay. Um, Any other? I had a question. Am I on mute? Nope. No, we hear you. Go ahead for it. Okay, uh, this is Commissioner Christensen. I'm so the appellant is Robert Edgren, and the applicant to have it removed, just to clarify, is the property owner. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, is there, as far as safety, I, I, in your presentation, has there been, I mean, safety is, is you're saying that the, the three leads that are coming off their potential for breakage, is that the safety concern? That's the primary safety consideration in this case is their attachment to the, to the base right. where they begin to split. Has there been any, and what, what is the property owner's primary complaint? Is it his, the breakage of his, you know, his personal property of like the sidewalk or is it falling leaves or falling branches or is there, is there, is, has he identified a primary complaint um, about the tree? I, I think I would rather let the, the owner and uh, their neighbor go into depth about their, their concerns, but I would okay. say Generally, it is in regards to the potential for leader failure. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Any other questions for staff before we uh, hear from the appellant? Seeing none, then we will open the public portion and we'll hear from Mr. Edgren first. Mr. Edgren, are you present? Mr. Edgren, if, once you turn off your mute, you are allowed to talk. I believe the the phone caller is also Mr. Edgren. Uh, we may want to unmute him as well. Okay. Hey, Mr. Edgren, are you there? 
You may have to press star nine on your phone to talk. Mr. Edgren? Katie, is he attempting to get through? I, you know, I, I can see that he's there and his hand is up. It, he's muted, so he needs to, um, if he's dialed in, he needs to press star nine on his phone to unmute. Do you hear that, Mr. Edgren? You need to press star nine on your phone. Or if he's participating via the live Zoom, he needs to press unmute on his screen. Oh, here oh, we looks go. Looks like he's unmuted. Looks like you're unmuted. Mr. Edgren? Looks like his computer is unmuted, but his phone is still muted. So if you can press <laughs> star nine on your phone. Oh, there we go. Mr. Egren? Oh. oh. Now he's disappeared. He's, the video is still working, but. That's why we need to start meeting in present. You're right, right? <laughs> I agree. In, per, in person, I mean. <laughs> Maybe we can start with the owner uh, of the property because they're also in the line. We do have okay. the owner and their, the neighbor present. Okay. Okay, we have. Ms. Lowry, are you there? Okay, I'm allowing Ms. Lowry to speak. She's muted and needs to unmute herself. Ms. Lowry, go ahead. <laughs> Ms. Lowry, you're muted and you need to unmute yourself. Ms. Bushbinder is available if you'd like to take her comment first. Who is that, Katie? Emily Bushbinder is available. Okay. Okay, Emily, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so I'm the property owner next door, and um, this tree is causing damage to the property. So first of all, the parking for my business is in the back of my building, and there's a walkway that where clients come from the parking lot to the front of my building, and it's between 525 and 527. So the, um, the pine tree has basically buckled the, um, uh, the walkway. And so not only does water pool there in a rainy season, which I wish we had had this year, but we did not, but it also creates a fall risk for my clients. I'm an estate planning attorney. Most of my clients are elderly and that creates a real risk even in good weather. In bad weather, the pine cones are falling, the, the needles are falling, the branches threaten to fall. The tree branches ran, reach out over my building and they have actually prevented my placing anybody in one of my offices. So that front office I can no longer use. I've actually moved myself into that office because I need all of the offices in my building right now, and I can't put an employee in that office. So it's creating substantial danger to me, my clients, my staff, and my property. We okay. had an arborist come out to evaluate the tree. You know, I'm, I'm a very proud tree hugger. I love trees. I don't want to cut them down. 
And the opinion of the arborist that we brought out said, there's no way to do anything but take this tree down. And why is it you can't fill the front office? Because the branches and the debris coming down make me concerned that a branch is going to come down, break through the roof, and, and injure an employee or myself, because now I'm sitting in that front office. And, you know, it's obviously on a good weather day, it doesn't seem like such a danger, but this, this winter we've had tremendous wind, and um, I had to take the employee that was in that office and say, you need to come out of that office, you can't occupy that office anymore. So I can't use part of my space. Okay. Any, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, just that uh, I, I really appreciate your your work and, and your time. Okay. Thank you for your input. And by the and, way, uh, if you yes. would like me to transplant that tree to Splash Car Wash, I'm sure the owner would be happy to do that, but I don't <laughs> 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 Okay. So that, that brings us back. Is Mr. Edgren available yet? So his hand is up. Um, and it looks like he's unmuted. Uh, Mr. Egren, can you, oops, let me see. Let me see. Uh, Mr. It looks Egren, like he. There we go. Oh. Mr. Egren, can you speak? Oh my gosh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, great, great. Boy, this is, <laughs> this is about one of the most confusing things I've ever walked through. Uh, things don't work that are, you know, the uh, descriptions of how to access it. They're, they're either not functioning or something's going on. But anyway, okay, back to the tree. Uh, uh, yeah. I, excuse me. Oh, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Edgren, turn up his volume. Turn off? Turn up. Turn up your volume a bit so we can all hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm talking through my phone. So anyway, in regards to the tree, um, I've been here since what, 1975, okay? I always walk by that tree. I always kind of noticed it because I thought the little, little, the little um, uh, bungalow there was kind of cute and it had all these kind of river rocks around it and kind of a funky little place. But the tree has been there a long, long time. It's been there longer than any of us. Uh, my assessment, and I had a tree... Uh, tree service look at it, uh, they said it's a healthy tree. There's nothing wrong with it. You look up at the top of it, there's no rusty uh, pine needles. That's the first uh, sign of a bad, of a sick tree. Um, you know, the neighbor next door moved in, purchased that little building next door, and she made a fuss about, I guess we had a big wind. I kind of remember that. I think it nearly blew off my roof. Um, probably happens every 50 years, but uh, I guess some acorns hit her uh, top and everything. Anyway, to make a long story short, you know, that was, the tree has been there a long time. The thing with the three branches that shoot up there, I talked to another uh, arborist, and they said, oh, you just cable those together or strap them together, and it actually is stronger than a single branch going up. So... You know, I, I read over Ed Mor Morrison's, I believe, uh, report, and uh, I wanted to make a bet uh, with him saying that, you know, in 30 years, let's meet at this tree. And if it's still standing, you pay me 100 I'll pay you 100 whatever. Um, bottom line is the tree's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It provides a tremendous amount of cooling in that area. And I don't know if, any, if, if you all read my reports about I did a lot of research on the value of a tree and um but this is you know this is just not the tree itself this also has to do with the the three um professional buildings there uh, i don't know the exact uh, addresses but they're all in a row and in the back and i remember those lots and the little houses that were there there was trees on them okay anyway i think it was 1977 they built the um those three clinics or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but they did no landscaping, very little landscaping. The, you talked about the situation in the parking lot. 
This parking lot, which spans three lots, that's uh, what, uh, 120 feet wide, goes all the way to the back fence, all the way to the back fence with no trees, okay? Uh, and that area gets very hot, very hot during the summer. So hot you can't walk on it with bare feet. Um, not a good idea, not a good idea. So I know, you know, that, that's not the subject of this meeting, but I think it should be. I think it should be taken into consideration that, um, whatever was approved back in 1976 or 77 shouldn't have been. And, uh, you know, you've got different owners now, or is it one? Uh, Mr. Mr. Edgar, if we could stick to the topic, we're not, we're not discussing the, the clinic property right now. We're discussing the tree. Okay, the heat that comes off the asphalt parking lot is cooled to a certain degree by this tree. You take that tree away, you're going to have an oven right around that whole area, circumference of that whole area. And you've got a little break with this tree cooling part of it. Um, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with the tree. You know, I, I would suggest tabling this. Get a arborist out there, an independent arborist, because I believe they had an arborist that's connected with uh, Lewis Tree Service. Well, you know... <laughs> Okay, let's go. You know, it's just kind of a conflict of interest, I think. And uh, my guy said there's nothing wrong with it. So, and I was reading the uh, Emily's uh, report, and she said, uh, well, we had uh, pine cone hand grenades <laughs> coming down during that big storm. You, you know, you live with nature. You know, this is not like, uh, not like uh, living up in Boulder Creek where you're going to have fires every, every so often. Um, what, what's a few pine cones? Is that really going to hurt people? But I guess she's afraid that it's going to whole collapse on her um, her uh, office there. But she's only owned a few months. I haven't talked to the former owner, but I would like to. Uh, the other thing is, I, I wrote in my report. I said, you know, according to Morrison's report on that tree, uh, I went driving around Depot Hill. Heck. I would say half the trees up on Depot Hill fall within his description of sick trees or bad trees or whatever you want to call them. And it's like, <laughs> bring up Carmel, but if you even, so you even get some whiff of you cutting down a tree, you're in big trouble. Um, no, I think this needs more study. And at the end of my report, I think the city needs to look at a whole different um, assessment of trees, treating them as something more than just trees. Um, the, these are assets to a community, to a neighborhood, to a block. You drive Cap down Capitola Avenue now, and I can't even imagine what it would be like without that tree there. It, <laughs> we already chopped one down on Capitola Avenue. It was a beautiful tree. Even the tree cutters didn't Mr. want to cut it down. Mr. Edgren, Mr. Edgren, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of rambling. I'm just wondering if we can kind of wrap this up. Okay, sure. Well, <laughs> uh, save the tree. And I think uh, if you don't want to vote on it tonight, table it until we get more information. Let's hire an independent arborist. Um, there are those out there that like to save trees. Um, let's uh, get more information on it, which hopefully will lead to a whole new process for trees in Capitola. Um, that's where I'm coming from. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Edwin. Appreciate your you. uh, your concern and your appeal. Thank you. Thank hey, you. Katie, do we have anyone else wishing to speak? Thank you, Mr. Edwin. Yes, we Thank have... No, the, there was a hand up. Yes, Liliana Molda. And it looks like the previous speaker has their hand up again. And so just a, um, a reminder that we typically don't go back and forth with after public speaking, but uh, Liliana. Yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to entertain a, an online dispute between commenters here. So okay. who's, who's the newest person that would like to speak? Can we have her on now? Yes. 
Hello, this is Shelley Laurie on uh, Lillian Mulder's computer right now. So we have a technical difficulty as well. So I'm Shelley Laurie. I'm the owner of the property. And I respect what Mr. Edgren has to say. I respect what Emily Bookbinder has to say. Uh, we all appreciate the benefit of trees. However, there are times when there are trees that happen to be in the wrong location, be the wrong type of tree, and pose a problem or a hazard or a danger to the health and safety of people. This is right at the sidewalk. It is uh, causing property damage to the adjoining neighbor. The adjoining neighbor, Ms. Bookbinder, and I have discussed the removal of the tree and working together as good neighbors. I can appreciate, again, that people like trees. This is a pine tree which has three trunks coming off of it. It has had multiple people look at it. I have created, uh, I had contacted Lewis Tree Service. Ms. Bookbinder contacted another, I think it was Community Tree. Um, Community Tree is who she's referring, referring to as far as it being a diseased tree and a problem. Also, Lewis Tree said it was a problem. Also, the city of Capitola says it has problems. So it, it, it's a tree that um, has reached its economic, I mean, reached its uh, lifespan under the opinions of these experts. I, as a property owner, don't want damaged sidewalks. I don't want people falling and on pine cones. I don't want people being injured. And, and I don't want limbs falling, knocking out power lines, possibly causing personal damage to people walking down the sidewalk or cars that may be parked on the street. And as Ms. Bookbinder mentioned, she is an attorney. She deals with senior citizens that come to her office. It's irrelevant how long she has owned the property, and we collectively have just have communicated and agree as neighbors that this is the best for each of us to do. We have we have as a condition a replacement tree. We've uh, and so on the property there will be a tree replaced. I listened to Mr. Edgren and I appreciate that he wants to preserve the tree. However, he also, in my communication with him, is that he wants to address the city of Capitola's tree policy, and this is the tree that he wants to preserve as an example for what the city should be doing. I don't think that should be the basis for whether or not a tree is removed. So if there are any questions you have for me, I appreciate that, the, and we'll address these questions, but this is uh, my position. Thank you, Ms. Boulder, for your input. This okay. is Do Shelley, we have anyone I'm else? Sorry, to... This is Shelly Laurie. I'm actually on Lillian Molda's computer. Oh, I'm okay. I'm the property. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. Is there anyone else? out there that would wish to speak to this item. I, I just, Katie, are we seeing anyone that hasn't spoken before? No, I'm not I seeing... I a question, Ms. Lowry. I, I'm not seeing anyone on Zoom at this point and also not no emails regarding this Okay. Item. Mr. Numa, was that you or Mr. Wilk that wants a question? I have a quick question for the last speaker. What do you plan to replace the tree with? Do you know? Um, I'm considering a crepe myrtle because I love the colors and the vibrancy. Uh, they have a beautiful bark, and uh, I think that would be an enhancement to the property. Thank you. Okay. Thank I, I you, Ms. Lowry. Can Mr. I have Wilk? a question to staff? I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Wilk. Um, it's a question of staff, I guess. Uh, if this appeal was denied, could it be then appealed further to the city council? Um, 
if this appeal was denied, I, I believe it ends at that point. Um, no, I actually, I'm sorry. If, if this is a, if it was appealed to the Planning Commission, I, I, be, um, I believe it can get, still be appealed to the City Council. I can look that up quickly, but I, I believe they have the, the ability to appeal it further. That might influence my vote, so I'd appreciate that information. Thank you, Mr. Wilk. Okay, anyone else in the public wishing to comment on this item? Three removal appeal of 527 Capitol Avenue. See not, we will close the public portion and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Who wants to lead off? I'll start. Um, Let's take Ms. Mr. Newman. Uh, Christensen, do you want to start? Oh, uh, I just, I just had a quick comment, honestly. Um, I just, I, I honestly feel that if the property owner and the tenant of the property feel that they're, I mean, they've brought, they've gone to the trouble to bring it to the city to find, you know, these findings that to, to remove this tree, the city has gone to the trouble of, of, you know, making these determinations. Um, it's, it's, I think, I mean, I've, I've observed this tree personally. It's a, it's very giant. And, and if they're willing to replace it with something more appropriate, I, I, I find no valid reason. I mean, I don't want to lead into, you know, my determination. I'm just saying that like, it's just, I, I keep hearing these tree arguments and it's the property owners are, anyway, I just, I feel that I appreciate the property owners and the tenants of the property coming to plead their case. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Christensen. Commissioner Newman. So, um, yeah, I was interested in the type of tree because uh, I thought it was a Monterey pine and uh, I've observed numerous Monterey pine trees reach the end of their life and they don't they're not like redwood trees that live to be a thousand years old. They live, live to be 60 or 70 years old. And I think that's important to me because taking the long view here, 30 years from now, if we don't allow this tree to be removed, it's probably not going to be there anyway. But if they plant a new tree now in 30 years, we'll have a great canopy. So I don't see the long-term benefit of maintaining a tree that is pretty much at the end of its life and postponing the replacement so that there we can all enjoy a, a tree that is more suitable right now for the spot. And I, I, I found the um, cities uh, and the staff report to be very compelling. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Anyone else? Uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, you know, I, I think an urban forest in a town is an important thing to have. But um, people always bring up Carmel and uh, how well they do. And the reality is in Carmel, they do remove a number of trees annually, and they have a very aggressive program of replanting trees. And as Commissioner Newman mentioned, this is a Monterey pine tree, and if you look it up, um, they say that the longest they will live is somewhere between 70 to 80 years. So it, it is an old tree that was planted in the wrong place. And uh, I agree that the tree should be removed and come out. Um, I do think that the city has allowed a number of trees to be removed and when we ask for a replacement tree, we often don't get anything that is equivalent to the tree that has left. Um, you know, the owner has talked about that they would be willing to plant a crepe myrtle. And if you read the um, list of trees that was done by John Allen, which I think was done in about 2013, he talks about a crepe myrtle tree as being one that gets 15 to 30 feet tall 
and it's suitable for, you know, parkway or median type use. So I do think if we're going to allow someone to take out um, what is a major tree, they should, it should be replaced um, with a tree that's actually going to grow up to be a real tree, not a large bush. So I, I would ask my fellow commissioners to consider um, requiring the applicant to plant a tree that's ultimately going to get to the 30 or 40 foot range. Doesn't have to be, you know, a 100 foot tall redwood tree, but um, something that will contribute to the urban forest of this particular neighborhood because as Mr. Edgren mentioned, there aren't too many trees in the area. I also read through um, his comments about, uh, you know, some of the things that needed to be changed as far as the city's tree ordinance is concerned. And I agree sometime in the future because I think the staff's pretty overwhelmed right now that we should look at our tree ordinance and perhaps consider rewriting it. But the one thing I would like to see us do right now is change the fee that we charge for somebody to appeal um, a tree being removed. It costs $136 um, for your application fee to take out a tree. And then we say for the public to appeal that or participate in that process, they have to pay a fee of $536. And that's because in the city's fee schedule, we have one fee for appealing any administrative decision. And I would like to see the Planning Commission uh, recommend to the council that perhaps that um, appeal of administrative decisions have more than one fee number in there because I don't think it's appropriate to have to pay uh, the $536 to, to appeal a tree. Um, I also would support his request that uh, the signs on, that go up on the trees, right now we do an eight and a half by 11 sign. The city easily has the capability of doing an 11 by 14 sign. It's printers and everything easily print that, that size appeal letter and it would be a lot easier for the public to see. So in summary, I'm in favor of taking the tree out. I would like to see something other than a crepe myrtle tree planted. I would like to see us consider making a recommendation to the council regarding the appeal to a tree removal appeal fee. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Any other comments? Yes, yeah, Commissioner Wilk, I'll go. So first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Edgren for his hard work and, and appreciate, appreciation of the trees. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sympathetic, but not, not to the extent that, uh, that, that I, I would approve his appeal. And the reason is because um, we really need this heritage tree list. Uh, the city isn't that big. We should be able to go around and, and, and be able to list which trees need saving. And we have no heritage tree list and, and there's reasons for that. But that, that would, that would go a long way towards providing not only guidance for us in making decisions as to whether or not a tree could be saved, but it would be guidance for real estate agents and home buyers and business buyers that said, hey, you know, be careful, you know, you've got the foundation of this building close to a tree and it's a heritage tree and so take that into account because it might damage your foundation. And they could buy the property being aware that the tree is special and needs to have consideration. And finally, there might be an opportunity if it was a heritage tree list or a, you know, some sort of list that Mr. Edgren proposed, we could actually provide funding for the maintenance of such trees. But we have none of those things. So it's very difficult for me to tell a property owner that this tree that they had no idea was very special to the city council or the city or the community at large suddenly has to remain a safety slash property hazard. So hence, we do have the criteria, um, the three different criteria for allowing a, the removal 
Um, I'm not sure I buy the safety issue. Um, that's why I'd be curious to see this go to the city council because the last two issues that we had on trees, the city council, the first time they overturned our ruling, and then the second time we just we, we just allowed the tree to be removed for the same reason, because of branches were actually falling and damage was done and there was pictured evidence of uh, of damage being done. Here we don't have that. Um, we have different inputs. We don't have a, 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 a arborist report in the package, just conflicting statements. Some say it's uh, uh, it's towards the end of its life and it's, it's damaged others say it's healthy but ultimately what what I'm impressed with is the uh, danger to the, the, the property um, not so much the driveways or the walkways but the actual foundation of the building as evidenced by the cracked stucco so I don't see how we can we can burden a property owner with trying to save a tree when it's destroying his property or his or her property um, with regards to the crepe myrtle, I think that's covered in uh, the, that issue is covered with canopy coverage, um, which is the one good thing I think we can let hang our hat on in the, in the tree ordinances, which is, um, you know, you want the 15 to 30 percent canopy coverage and this property meets that. So with the crepe myrtle, it meets the ca canopy coverage. I'd be I'd be happy with the crepe myrtle, even though it, it, it wouldn't be. Uh, necessarily a big tree. Um, beyond that, let's see. Yeah, I, uh, I guess that's it. Um, so I, uh, I'm ready to make, well, that, that, those are my comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wilk. I, I just have a comment. Uh, I'm concerned how easy it is in this city now to get trees removed. It never used to be like this. It was it's always a lot more difficult to do. And in the past several months, and Mr. Wilkes, you alluded to this, we've lost the largest tree up in the Jewel Box neighborhood on the entire hill, the cedar on Capitol Avenue. And we've lost that redwood tree on, on uh, what was it, Lincoln Prospect? 49. Uh, 49. 49. Uh, you know, the trees weren't diseased. There was nothing wrong with them. Proper maintenance could have saved those trees, but the city allows them because the property owner says it's a danger. And in this case, you know, we've got a similar thing. We do have some property damage, but I, I just think we need to look at our what, how we're allowing trees to be removed so easily in this city. Uh, my other thing is Mr. Edgren spent $500 to appeal this. I think we owe it to him to have an independent arborist look at this tree. That would be my my recommendation. I, I really feel he deserves that, having gone to the trouble to appeal this. So with that, I'll end my comments, entertain any motions that anyone would care to, to make. Do we have a do we have a, an answer about the appeal to the city council? Yes. Ms. Katie, did were you able to look that up? We did. And the the applicant could appeal this to the city council. So okay. Can I ask the chair, Mr. Ruth? Yes. Um, so what you're suggesting is that we continue this while we have an arborist look at the tree? Correct. I think I'm, we owe that to the person who's made the appeal. I'm prepared to uh, try a motion. That's okay. Oh, go for it. <laughs> I don't think uh, when we're hearing an appeal that we have the ability to put conditions on it. So I think it's an up or down uh, vote. So I'm going to move that we deny the appeal. I'll second. I would... This is Commissioner okay, we have a motion, motion and a second to deny the appeal and allow the tree to be removed. Any discussion on the motion? Any comments? Hearing none, Edna, could we have the roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Westman? No. Commissioner Wilk? 
Aye. Chair Ruth? The chair votes no. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, the permission has been granted to remove the tree. And that completes our agenda tonight, except for a few couple of items. Uh, do we have a director's report, Katie? We do. Um, okay, good evening, Planning Commission. Um, I, I've got a few updates for you. So on April 12th, the, the California Coastal Commission reviewed our zoning code update for certification. Uh, as you know, this effort's been going forth for about two and a half years, working with Coastal Commission staff. Um, when we went to Coastal Commission, they had basically four, their staff had four items that they wanted changed within our code. Um, two of them being the Inn at Depot Hill and the Monarch Cove Inn, they wanted to um, take away the underlying, the base zoning. We had had a base zoning of R1 for both of those properties. And the Coastal Commission staff was asking that the Inn at Depot Hill be visitor serving base zone with also visitor serving overlay. So basically just only, only allowed to do what's in the visitor serving zone. And for um, the Monarch Cove Inn, similar request. And then they also were removing our um, kind of negotiations of allowing residential at the Monarch Cove Inn in exchange for a public pathway or uh, visitors serving accommodation nightly use on that site. So their recommendations included both of those items. They also had a recommendation to fix the, uh, to edit the descriptions of the green bluff above the future, uh, above the old theater site for a future hotel. And the fourth item was to take away the allowance to build residential, a mixed use, pure residential above commercial on the old theater site. So when this went on April 12th, the Coastal Commission accepted all of the staff changes except for the Monarch Cove Insight. They, uh, the owners, the Blodgetts came out and spoke as well as uh, I think there were over a dozen public comments submitted to the Coastal Commission from the Depot Hill residents and I think four Depot Hill residents actually spoke at the hearing as well as the Blodgetts. And the Coastal Commission uh, were great listeners and they said this needs more time. We'd like this, uh, the Monarch Cove Inn to be uh, submitted separately so that the Coastal Commission can work with the owners and the residents. They understand both sides of the issue of that, of the location being uh, tucked away at the end of a residential neighborhood and the Blodgett's not being able to further invest into the property because of um, issues with, you know, not wanting to disturb the neighbors. So we've taken that, their, their recommendation was to take that out in, enti in its entirety, all the changes, to revert back to how it's been and we'll work on a modification uh, and bring it forth to Coastal Commission. So next week at City Council, uh, they'll be asked, I've recommended that they accept the changes um, requested from the Coastal Commission. And I think it is a great outcome to the extent that uh, we can continue to work with the Blodgetts on that one on that one property and the Depot Hill residents without it holding up the whole code. Um, so that was the first update. So hopefully next weekend, the, next week, the, the City Council is going to review that. The second update is our SB2 grant. Recently we gave you an update on um, the new standards that we'll be looking at for multifamily, the objective design standards. And the second portion of the SB2 grant is ADUs. Um, so we're going to be creating ADU guidance documents as well as prototype ADUs. And Matt Orbach has been working, uh, has been managing this project. Next week, the city council is going to be considering um, entering into a contract with a local uh, architect named Workbench. And so that will be considered and then we'll be moving forward with that project. And we're, um, we're planning on utilizing the Planning Commission as the design review board for the prototype ADUs. So you'll be seeing that project coming to you regularly with updates and uh, helping us with the decision making on designs as we move forward. Um, and lastly, 
Um, the IHO, our, our inclusionary housing ordinance, you'll recall last year we were working on our inclusionary housing ordinance trying to um, update it and then a, we had a, a lot of other things that stepped in the way and this is city council review of the inclusionary housing ordinance. Uh, at our, not next week's meeting, but the, um, the meeting at the end of May, I'll be giving an overview of the IHO and I plan to bring that also to planning commission at our next meeting to give you an update on the changes to the inclusionary housing ordinance. And we also do have a third party working on that uh, for the nexus study. So reevaluating the fees that we charge for our in lieus so I'm kind of, I'm calling 2021 our, our year of focusing on affordable housing with between the SB2 grant, um, this, we've got a LEAP grant that's active working on this IHO update and a um, couple great projects towards affordable housing. So, um, and hoping to get to the tree ordinance by 2022. <laughs> <laughs> but and let us know where you're gonna, where you're gonna build this affordable housing will you would you find that land <laughs> we're looking we're looking so um so you know exciting projects that i think will have a great great outcome i'm really excited about the adu prototypes and matt's work on that so that's my update for this evening great thank you katie any uh commissioner's report uh, I don't have a report. I just have one comment I would like to say. Um, in my particular neighborhood, we've had several people recently put in generator systems that come on automatically when the power goes out. And since we all live so close together, it's become a bit of a noise issue. So I was wondering if at some point uh, Katie or the building official could come back and tell us, you know, what's sort of required to put in these generators and if there's any way we can at least have some minimum noise standard for them or have them do some noise insulation. I can do that. So that's my comment. Yeah, I think you have to, don't you have to run them once a month for maintenance? I believe you do. <laughs> Yeah, and I understand, you know, why people want them and need them. It just seems like we could perhaps do a little better job so they don't become a neighborhood problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Susan. Anyone else? Do they require a planning permit? I don't think so. I think they only require a building permit. That's well, correct. Yeah. And I don't think we have any uh, jurisdiction over that. Yeah, we just look at them to see if they're in the setbacks and that's about it. But we can take a look and see if we could have some oversight. I think other cities do have some noise limits and insulation, noise insulation requirements. But that's a city council matter, not a planning commission uh, item. But we can recommend to them. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Susan. Anything else from anyone? Last chance? Hearing nothing, we'll adjourn the meeting to our next meeting in June. Thank All you, right. Katie. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye.